Welcome to Gardening and Beyond. I'm Lee Reeder. There are many reasons to garden, including better health and food security. Two more reasons are joy and satisfaction. Few things bring more of both than creating your own hanging basket of lush plants. Today's guests will teach us how to do this, just as they have done for hundreds of other contented folks. Greg and Tamara Clift own the family-run McKinsey River Nursery, to which they bring degrees in business, agricultural education, and horticulture. Their nursery specializes in hanging baskets, vegetable transplants, and select trees, shrubs, and berry plants. So, Greg and Tam, thanks for being here. Welcome to the show. That's good to be, to be here. I've really been looking forward to this show because <laughs> I, I'm just kind of a flower nut. I love hanging baskets, and I'm really excited to watch you put, it, put one together and hear your explanation of exactly the best way to do this. Good. But, but to begin with, why don't you just tell us more about uh, yourselves and how you got into this? Okay. Well, very good. Well, it turns out that Tamara uh, grew up on the farm there, and, and where we are is up the Mackenzie River. So we're about, uh, oh, five miles east of Springfield on the Mackenzie Highway. Why don't we go ahead with the first slide, and um, we can uh, talk a little bit about the nursery. This is our nursery, and um, it was about 1968 that they came out here. Uh, her father decided he was going to uh, buy his job, so they bought Mackenzie River orchards, and uh, you can see there's a barn. We actually have 30 acres, 31 acres. And about, oh, maybe an acre or two is nursery. So uh, he was doing mostly uh, wholesale fruits and vegetables. And uh, almost immediately he started uh, building greenhouses. There was one or two greenhouses on the property when he came. And I think he just didn't look forward to a career of climbing big old Gravenstein apple trees and. <laughs> And it was a lot of heavy work. So he started building the greenhouses. And um, eventually, as he wanted to retire, Tamara, who had a, a business degree, a business degree, and was sort of traveling around the country following her first husband, uh, decided that she would come back and farm with her father until things changed. And um, so that was what, early 90s? Uh, Mid-90s, 96, okay. 95, 96. And at the time, I was uh, an agronomist for the local farmer's co-op, Eugene Farmer's Co-op, which has since gone out of business. But uh, we ended up, through a strange set of circumstances, getting married in 1997 and um, thought at that time, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we could do the nursery together because her father was pretty much getting out of it. And uh, eventually, when that co-op went out of business in 2001, we did join together to, to do it full time. So um, some of the slides in there, and we could show a few more here, uh, show a little bit of the nursery and what we do. So this is actually a picture from our, the roof of our house, looking at the barn. We saw the front of the barn in the other picture. And uh, this was a snowy day, so I must have got up on the roof in uh, December, January, February. You can see some of the Mackenzie Hills there. We're kind of in the foothills. Uh, but there's probably three or four greenhouses there that we can see. So next slide. We do a lot of things in addition to hanging baskets, and Tamara is actually sowing onion seeds here. Uh, they look awfully big for onion seeds, but those are a coated seed. Typically, it's coated with sulfur or something just to make it a little bit bigger. Sulfur, by the way, would have some uh, antifungicidal or fungicidal characteristics also. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what we do about this time of year. Uh, next one. We also grow a lot of vegetable transplants. It was a couple years ago that we did a grafted tomato trial. And this is uh, me holding up a, one of our grafted tomatoes, uh, Mighty Tomatoes. And you can't see it too well, but down near the soil line, there is actually a graft there, just like you would graft a, an apple tree. And so we were given 15 or 20 of the grafted varieties, uh, some early girl, some big beef, whatever. And we planted those in our garden grew them all the way through the growing season, and then uh, harvested the fruit and things like that. So we try to be involved in all sorts of aspects of gardening. Next one. This is a, then a um, uh, early girl tomato. That was, I think, an early girl grafted tomato. This is what one of them would look like in probably August or September. Uh, we have a really large garden. We have 30 acres, so you can imagine there's plenty of room to grow things. <laughs> 
Yeah. So, uh, and that's by the way, the, the tomato cages that we make uh, are a big cagey thing with a, a fence post in the middle and they never fall over. So hmm. we could talk about that sometime too. Yeah. But uh, next one. So here's the basket making. And this would have been about two weeks ago. Right now, this is sort of the end of January. About the second week in January, we start making our own baskets. Uh, Tamara's putting plugs into those pots. We'll make about 50 baskets at a time. Today, we're gonna make one or two. Uh, next slide. Now, this is probably uh, early February. So those baskets that are on the bench behind her, those are baskets that she was working on uh, three weeks or four weeks ago. And the baskets in the front now are ones that are, she's making also with plugs. When we make the baskets, we get in these little bitty plugs, uh, or we might start them from cuttings ourselves. But... Uh, Can you say more about what a plug is? Yeah, a plug is just a small rooted plant. And so if we were gonna take cuttings from something like fuchsia, uh, Tamara is actually our propagator. Uh, she puts roots on those things. It takes maybe two to three weeks to get a good root on there. and. Uh, when we make those baskets, there are maybe five or six or more plants in a pot. Now, we can't make them with big plants, uh, although our workshops, they do that. But when we make them, we make them fast. So we need to have a thing with a little root on it like that that we can just stick in there. It's and about an inch by inch and a half, an inch wide in diameter, the root plug, the root zone, and about an inch and a half mm -hmm. deep. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a smaller version uh, starting to branch out a little bit. Yeah. We use a dibble and just kind of stick those babies right in there real quick and <laughs> they, they grow. They Very grow. efficient basket making. Very much. Uh, next one. Okay, so we're, we're moving on. And uh, this, uh, actually this picture was taken the same day. Uh, I just got up on top of the, uh, the bench and so you can see the baskets that are starting to grow. These are ivy geraniums. Ivy geraniums make a really nice complement in a basket. Mixed baskets are very popular. You can also see some baskets hanging up already. So by the time that, uh, go ahead to the next one, that we moved along in the season, this is what it looks like. And this picture was taken probably in early April. So those baskets that we saw on the bench, in about two months, this is what they look like. Uh, and at this time, they're also ready to sell. Uh, and the season keeps getting earlier and earlier, whether it's global warming or just people are getting antsy. They want to come out and buy a hanging basket in early April. We do sell them with warnings that if it gets cold, you better bring your basket inside or if it's mm -hmm. too rainy. So uh, next one. We also, this is a funny thing we do. We make upside down tomato planters and we have a workshop where we do that. Um, if you can notice, there's actually little tomatoes growing out of the bottom of that pot and herbs and things planted on the top. Next slide will show you what they look like uh, when they're uh, grown out pretty well. So go ahead with the next one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's grown out pretty well. <laughs> yeah. This picture was taken actually in mid-September. So by the time most people's tomatoes have gone down with late blight or they're just wondering why they don't grow, these things are just huge. And this is, believe it or not, kind of a small one. We've got them so that they're twice that size. Almost always we grow the little cherry tomatoes in them so that the branches aren't too heavy. Mm -hmm. But you've got tomatoes coming out the bottom uh, and on top we typically plant basil and then maybe some marigolds. And uh, we're harvesting on that basil all summer long. Yeah, you get at least uh, two, three harvests off of it making a lot of pesto. Yeah, that's right. Do you have to provide any kind of support at all to the tomato when it's growing out of the bottom? None whatsoever. I, the only problem we've had is that the tomato has gotten so heavy that uh, one year I used a plastic hook on that basket and the darn thing kind of wrenched itself and it fell down oh. and a couple of branches came off, but it was still about that big. So no, you never have to support it and we've never had a branch just break off because of the weight. But then you use cherry tomatoes as well right. to, uh, to avoid putting undue stress on it. Right, but it does get hundreds and hundreds of those tomatoes. So I suspect you could do it with the bigger tomatoes, but it's also a munchy plant. You walk by it and grab a few, and <laughs> rather than grabbing them by and eating an apple-sized yeah. tomato. So next one. Uh, this is a little something different. These are impatience bags. Uh, they are actually 10 little impatient plants in there. So they're a container also. And these are ones that, there's only one side. The back side is bare, so you can hang them against a fence post or a, a building. Mm -hmm. And this is on our nursery. This was taken in mid-July, 
Uh, you can see there's a, actually a trailing pansy down there, still going in July, and it's kind of in the shade. And then those uh, hanging baskets are uh, just make a real nice uh, complement to those, I think. Yeah. Next one. This is the fuchsia house. This is another greenhouse. And so this is what it would have looked like in mid-March, uh, just before we start our workshops. Uh, next picture. And this was probably in June or something like that. Tamara holding a fuchsia basket. We probably grow um, 15 or 20 varieties of fuchsias. Something like that. Yeah, it's one of the, the plants that does very well in shade. And as we talk about making these baskets, there's not a lot of things that do well in shade that are really colorful. But fuchsias are one that really do excel at that. So uh, next slide. And here's our class, and that's why we're here today. So we've been doing these workshops for about 10 years. The oldest slides I could find were from 2005. Uh, we're doing this now in 2015. So we started probably with, I don't even remember, a group of 10 or 15 Something. people. Something, yeah. It might have even been the Upriver Garden Club up the Mackenzie that said, would you guys do a workshop for us? And we said, well, sure we would. So um, one more slide, I think, on that. Uh, shows uh, the people, who, this is what they do. We, we talk for maybe 25 minutes, a half an hour, 45 minutes. Everybody has lots of questions. We tour the greenhouse and then we come back. People gather their plant material and start making their baskets. And then we keep the finished baskets in our greenhouses for until around Mother's Day. And when they take those baskets home, they'll be a really big full basket. And at the very end, we'll show you pictures of what the baskets look like. I think we just have one more that uh, relates to that. Okay, yeah, this is a, another picture. This was about the very first workshop. So uh, you can see people hard at work and they're not just using the little bitty plugs. They're using the full size plants that will grow quicker because mm -hmm. they only have them about a month in our greenhouse. Whereas when we start things in January, they've got about three months, four months to grow. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, he was, uh, Greg was talking about types of you know, baskets or containers they can use, and you can use just about anything that has good drainage. But most people like using just traditional baskets. It makes it a lot easier to do. And you got different sizes. You have your traditional plastic baskets, which are, you have two sizes. You have like a 10 inch or a 12 inch type basket. Uh, 10 inch is just a little bit less soil volume. 12 inch is larger. You got the, the pulp version of baskets. Is it wood pulp? Is that what that is? It's uh, paper pulp, wood pulp. pulp. Paper pulp. Yeah, it's uh, Corvallis. There's a plant up in Corvallis that they make this uh, recycled paper is yeah. what they Newspapers. use. Newspapers. Yeah. yeah. Great. And so uh, really it's nice. It uh, has some more porosity and more organic looking as mm -hmm. opposed to a plastic, which is definitely very finished looking. Mm -hmm. Then um, the other, you know, several other options. You know, you've got the wire baskets. This is a pretty heavy duty wire basket. You can line it with moss, or you can use um, like a ground cloth material or burlap, mm -hmm. something like that, so you can keep the soil in. Mm -hmm. And definitely much more porous. It's harder to construct because of the soil. You have to somehow keep the soil in until the roots colonize. Then you can get larger baskets. You get you know, as large as you want, really, as, much as, as long as you have a good hanger. You got a 14-inch diameter basket. This is what we used for the upside-down tomato baskets. What we've done is that we've drilled, I don't know if you can see it there, we've drilled a hole, a two inch hole in the bottom for, you know, to put the plant through and then we take a little ground cloth and just set it down in there and then we put our tomato underneath. It's hard for people to grasp the concept that you're putting the tomato upside down and filling the top with soil. They think there's some way that that ought to go upside and then grow down, yeah. but it doesn't. Then there are, you know, baskets that are colorful you have baskets that have holes in the side. This type of basket is designed for things that don't trail a lot, that if you want to have like a ball like those bags that you saw, you can use impatiens, wax begonias, anything that doesn't trail, and so you get a nice mound of color, which is really nice. The other thing, uh, people have used uh, wall hangers or planter bath wicker, and what we've done with that, we just line it with a ground cloth, so that way you can keep your soil in, you're protecting some of the wicker, and make sure you clean it out every year though, so that way the wicker doesn't rot. Because with the moisture in our climate, it's easy for
for that to rot. So you would not be able to leave that over the winter with soil and things in it. You would have to clean it out. Most definitely, yeah. because you don't want that. If you want to keep your basket, you don't want it to rot, yeah. just like the pulp. Although these do take a long time to decompose. Mm -hmm. They take, because they've got a, a nice wax co coating on them. So that way, they're just a nice alternative. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. So you're only limited, you're limited by your imagination and make sure you got good drainage mm -hmm. on your containers. We tend to use these baskets for our shade plants. Um, originally, before they started coating them with the wax, they dried out quite quickly. And now I don't think they dry any more quickly than a plastic basket. But um, the, um, we also like the look. When the fuchsia is growing out of here, it, it really looks earthy. Yeah, um, it also, I like the look. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's definitely a more of a neutral look and yeah. blends in nicely. I would say quite a few, maybe, I don't know, 25% of the people that come to the workshops make these, but quite a few do. Uh, that's a nice look. And mm. so um, you get, these are the different types, and then bags. Now we didn't, uh, we forgot to bring one of those, but it's really just like a plastic, heavy duty plastic bag with holes punched in it. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same idea as that, that, same as the, that. container that has holes on yeah. the sides. Yeah. Yeah. Did we bring our big 10-gallon basket in? I, yes. I thought we did. We did. Let's, let's it's show in that. the front. Uh, Let me get the, it. Yeah. We've been growing hanging baskets for Walterville, the Walterville Shopping Center, for now about 12 years. When we first started growing those baskets... Oh, uh, I got a 10-inch. Okay. They, yeah, there's the difference between those two, those baskets right there. But this is downtown Eugene now, the U of O. If there's going to be city baskets, that's what we call them, a city baskets, they're in a 10-gallon basket. And so uh, that, uh, it's huge. And so people wonder, well, why do ours succeed, you know, uh, or the ones downtown Eugene, and my little ones don't? Well, there's a big difference in soil volume. So um, that's one reason. If people come to our workshops, they can make one of those too, but they're going to pay for it. Have you seen those things, that, there are inserts that you can put in a, a container that, that stops the soil like ha so that it's only in the top half mm -hmm. of the container? What do you think about that? Well, when we do the baskets, we want as much soil as we can get. Now, if it's a, uh, like a tall, skinny planter or something with only a few plants in the top, that's no problem they, because you don't need that much root zone. Um, you're primarily... Well, one thing that you're doing there is you're lessening the weight of it, too, since it's not soil all the way to the bottom. You could put uh, something else is down there that's got more air space. Especially but, if you're going to be moving, like planters, it's, I think, a legitimate idea for larger planters, so it can allow you to move it. Mm -hmm. And also saves on soil if you don't yeah. want to use as much soil. So but, it's not, not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. It's what you want to do with your container. It depends on the purpose for the container and mm -hmm. the plant you put in it. Yep. Okay. But survivability, what we find is that by August, we, you know, we need to give it as much water as we can. So we really need as much soil and volume as we can get, mm -hmm. uh, at least with, with hanging baskets. Yeah, so, that makes uh, sense. Good. So um, why don't we move on and talk a little bit about soil. Um, we brought some of our soil with us today that we'll be using. And we use just a regular potting soil. If you're to go to your garden center or a landscape product supplier, there's a number of things you can ask for, but potting soil is what you want if you're using for the baskets. Uh, it's very light, it holds moisture, but yet it allows moisture to drain away quite quickly. One thing we always tell people uh, at the workshops is we don't put dirt in here, our garden soil. It's kind of funny because when people bring us a plant to trade or something like that, or they'll dig something out of the garden and say, here, I want you to have it, almost always it's just in garden soil. And that thing would weigh 15 or 20 pounds. <laughs> and there's a couple other reasons for that. One is that garden soil can have weed seeds, insects, diseases, and things like that. And we're in a real controlled environment. We're, we're in a, a greenhouse. Um, when somebody takes that basket home, we don't want it to have weeds. We don't want it to weigh 50 pounds. And so we, um, we try to keep it light. This is actually about a third peat moss, a third pumice, and a third composted bark. If, uh, and ours is Douglas fir bark. If we lived in the southeast, it might be composted pine bark, something like that. But uh, the soil that we get is made locally. Uh, we try to keep it local if we can. 
and uh, it works real well for us. Um, have you uh, have you thought about using that um, coconut fiber that they make now as an alternative to peat moss? I'm told it's more sustainable. It is more sustainable, but the coconut trees in our area uh, have kind of declined over the years. <laughs> so we've decided that if we're going to be local, we should stay local. <laughs> and the peat moss is local? The, the peat moss actually comes from, uh, I think our peat moss probably comes from Canada, which if they put a pipeline in here, they could probably just... <laughs> Uh, ship it directly to our farm. <laughs> All right. All Frank, right. Uh, maybe you should talk a little bit about the soil. Uh, miracle Grow has come out with this soil oh, that has the moisture right. holding. There is nothing in the world wrong with miracle Grow potting soil. Because um, we do sell miracle Grow. That has a little bit of fertilizer in it. And one of the things that we find people have the problem with is fertilizing their baskets enough. And so that, that's very helpful. It's, it's very similar in texture to this. We don't use it in our baskets. We buy it by the semi-load, the soil, and a semi-load of a miracle Grow potting soil is very expensive. Mm -hmm. So um, the, um, what she was referring to is the moisture holding little things that go in that. And um, it's a good idea if you're making your baskets. It's a little, it's a polymer that soaks up water and uh, keeps the basket moisture in the summertime. The problem we have is that in the springtime, you can hardly keep the baskets dry enough and people kill their baskets more by overwatering than underwatering. So if we were to make the baskets of that in early spring or in spring, they would stay wet just too long. And, um, but if I was to make a basket in July or so, uh, I would probably use something like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So you okay. talked about some fertilizer? And so moving on then to fertilizer, that is probably, it, it's one of the keys to getting a very good hanging basket. Um, we don't have a finished basket because it's so early, but I'm just gonna show a plant here. These are last, well, not this, uh, these are six packs that Tamara planted just about three weeks ago. This is a real uh, popular plant called Bacopa. And uh, I bring this up though to say that we can tell we're fertilizing enough if that plant stays green and flowering all over. And you'll see some pictures later of our baskets that we've grown. Very rarely are they bare on top and all the flowers are down here, but that is what people will complain about. Uh, into August, all the flowers are down here. It's bald on top. They call up and say, what do I do? And uh, well, you should have fertilized more during the season. We've gotten so that we just tell people it doesn't matter what you fertilize with, just fertilize with something. Uh, when we have the baskets in, the, in our uh, greenhouses, they're fertilized almost every time they're watered. Uh, now they don't get watered every day in the greenhouses. Uh, in fact, ones that we planted a couple of weeks ago have only been watered one time since that initial watering, and it's been two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. But when we do water, we use sort of a miracle Grow type of product. Uh, I think, go ahead and uh, we'll, I think we've got some pictures here of some fertilizer bags. Yeah, this is what we use. It's called Technigrow. It's like miracle Grow, but we buy it in larger sacks. That's a 17526, which is actually our summer blend. The numbers on there, 17, 5, and 26, those mean, uh, that might be a 24. I'm getting old. I think it's a 24. Okay. Uh, 17, nitrogen, 6, phosphorus, and 24, potassium. Those are all necessary plant nutrients. And um, we do, an, uh, let's go to the next one here. Uh, this is an injector that we use. It's a fertilizer injector that injects fertilizer into the water there's a backflow preventer so that nothing goes back down into our irrigation system and ultimately that we would drink it. So that's how we, um, we fertilize our plants. A homeowner can do that with a little um, instrument called a hose-on proportioner. And the hose-on fits between your hose and the faucet. And then this little um, a tube here would fit down in your bucket of fertilizer concentrate. You turn the water on and now you just water like normal. It's really quite interesting. You could do that with organic fertilizer too, if it's something like a fish emulsion fertilizer. Mm -hmm. um, we are not organic and we don't grow our baskets organically, but if you wanted to, you could use a product like an all-purpose uh, organic plant food. This is a 444, so really the other one is three times as strong. Um, and it just takes more. It just takes more fertilizer to give it enough nutrition that it, it does very, very well. I think the next picture we have on the slides too is of an osmocote. 
And Osmocote is a pretty well-known brand. There's other ones out there now, too. But Osmocote takes regular conventional fertilizer and puts a coating around it so that it lasts from three to four or maybe even up to eight or ten months. And a lot of times, if we put that on top of the baskets and people water normally, they'll be fertilizing enough for a basket that doesn't take much fertilizer, like a begonia basket, but, but not enough for a big petunia basket because they're really heavy feeders. So, um, and then when you do do the watering with the water-soluble fertilizer, make sure that when you water, it does drain out the bottom of the pot because you want to be able to get fertilizer all through there so the roots have, are able to reach to the fertilizer and also to prevent the salts building up within the soil. So, so, so for s folks who are not experts uh, at these things, how would they know that one kind of plant is a heavy feeder and another one is not? How, how do they find that out? They ask us. Oh. <laughs> or, <laughs> or they Google it. Google's or, a or wonderful and thing. Also, and also, sometimes you can tell with the color, the way the plants are reacting. Nitrogen tends to be the first. It's, it, correct me if I'm wrong. Nitrogen is the first to lose. So if you have lighter green leaves and darker older leaves, is that correct? Then it right. is a, kind of a nitrogen shortage. I talked a little bit about that plant being bald on top. And the reason for that is that nitrogen is quite mobile in the plant. If there's a shortage of nitrogen, it wants to go to the newest growth at the expense of the old growth. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we have lots of nice new growth on the bottom. And that's where the flowers start coming out. If we have enough nitrogen to feed not only that, but the old growth as well, we keep growing more plant, and that's where the new flowers are. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, one of the funny ones is tomatoes, that we'll have people buying our tomato plants, and you saw that one earlier that was a nice green plant. They'll be in within two weeks with a yellow leaf saying, my plant is turning yellow, I bought it here, what do I do? <laughs> and almost always, it will be one of the lower leaves, and it will be yellow because of lack of nitrogen. Some people wrongly assume that just because they used compost, which is a wonderful thing, that's enough. They don't need to fertilize again. But there's not a whole lot of nutrition in uh, compost, at least enough to feed that plant for the whole season. Now, if you've been an organic gardener for 25 years and your soil in your garden is so rich, it probably is enough. But if you're talking about a container, and uh, what's very popular now are raised beds, which kind of take away the dirt part of being in the ground. And so essentially you've got a, a, a raised planter, almost like a, a hanging basket, and they, they don't hold nutrition very well. So um, it's color, it's that lack of growth. Um, also on the fertilizer line. And Googling. And Googling, that's correct. <laughs> YouTube. I've, I've learned so much from YouTube. <laughs> well, <laughs> Haven't we all? Yes, we have. <laughs> So. But then in, in regards to the watering, too, how often to water, it's when the baskets are smaller earlier in the season, you, need to wa you don't have to water as often. In fact, that was Greg was saying earlier, that that's a big cause of basket decline is too much water early in the season. You have to wait till the soil is dry. Uh, conversely, later in the season, they need more water. You no, know, the, if the plants get real big and the basket is covered, you no, know, covering the whole basket, they'll need to water it. At least probably every day, especially as the temperatures rise, maybe even twice a day. The big city baskets in come August, we're doing on the 90 plus degree days, we're mm -hmm. watering them twice a day, yeah. morning, evening. So it's, it's just a matter of knowing how, oft, how, how fast your basket dries out, how frequently you need water. And when you do water, make sure it does drip out the bottom. It makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so on the watering front, when people make their baskets, they'll leave them with us. We water them in. Oftentimes, once they're watered in, they might not be watered for about two weeks. Uh, when we water them, we do use fertilizer. So the hard part is, once they're uh, full grown and people take them home, is, is teaching them or helping them water correctly. Um, I brought a, what we use when we water a hanging basket is a wand that's got a hook on it. And so what this allows you to do is to get up there and um, let's keep it down here. Um, <laughs> and uh, water that basket where you're just keeping the water on the soil. If we, we're not trying to water foliage, that doesn't do anything. When we see those ads on TV where a husband is out there spraying it like he'd spray his car, <laughs> that's not reality. He, that hose would be better off laying on the ground, just dribbling and soaking in. Yeah. yeah. So, um, 
Uh, so we use these. We probably have a half, well, three or four of them in the nursery. Mm -hmm. We put a lot of our waters on drip irrigation so that once we hang those baskets, uh, we don't have to send a, somebody in there to water every one of them. It's a job and a half. Yeah. And, and I think it's a drip for the homeowner. It's something to be aware of. It's a nice convenience to have. The challenge is how often uh, with the frequency that you water with, because if it's uh, tied in with your landscape plants, it's not necessarily good for the baskets. Mm -hmm. And early in the season versus late in the season, you have to adjust the timing. If you go on vacation and you end up uh, being bad weather and it's going every day, you're getting too much water to your baskets. So drip irrigation can be good. You just have to be conscientious about monitoring it, knowing yeah. if your baskets need as much as it's giving you. Also shade versus sun, a windy location versus a protected location. Sure. Those are all variables in regards to watering. Sure, good. So talk about insects and diseases and other, okay. other attackers. Why don't we bring up a slide here, Joe? Uh, this is, um, I think, the slide that we're going to see here. Okay, <clears throat> this is a before picture and an after picture. This picture was taken, I believe, in September. Now, if we go to the next one, and let me just say, okay, so this is what happened in the meantime. These are called a tobacco budworm. Tobacco budworm are like a little cutworm. They get in there, and they, uh, tobacco is a relative of uh, petunia, or petunias of tobacco, and these will eat the flowers off. And they also will attack geranium flowers and... Um, Gera petunias and geraniums. Petunias primarily. and geraniums, yeah. And you can see how big they are. Those are healthy ones. You could take those fishing tomorrow and probably catch a pretty good sized trout. <laughs> so next picture. That's an after picture. Oh, so that God, basket, that's heartbreaking. Yeah, that's one basket, by the way, that's just laying on the ground in one of our greenhouses. So the picture that we saw first was actually taken after we sprayed, and we probably used something like BT, which is an organic stomach mm -hmm. poison, very specific to the worms or, or the caterpillars. Yeah. And so uh, that picture was then taken a month after this. So it, they will grow out and flush again. But people will just assume that the petunias in particular go downhill. You know, at uh, it's the end of July, it's the 1st of August, my petunias are, you know, they just <laughs> ran out of steam and they do this. Well, that's not the case. If you've been fertilizing well and you've controlled your insects like that cutworm, uh, you won't have that problem. Uh, that's kind of humorous that it, it can be that denuded of flowers and, and grow out as well as it did. Let's show one more picture yeah, after that one, because I believe those are, these are the same hanging baskets at our uh, Walterville Community Center, and those are in those big 10-gallon baskets. But this brings up a couple points. One is that uh, the, the insects didn't get to these baskets. They look beautiful. I'm a real stickler. There isn't hardly a place on there that doesn't have a flower. But you'll also notice that the flowers are covering the entire basket from the top to the bottom. That means we're feeding enough. Mm -hmm. If they were all down here, or uh, it, it was very sparse, then we haven't done our job. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're going to move on and make a basket. Yeah. Oh, well, there other are a couple other, too. yeah, other insects and, and diseases too. Um, we talked uh, aphids, white flies, thrips. Um, those are biggies. Uh, I think of flea beetles and things like that, but they're not such a problem on baskets. But aphids certainly can be mm -hmm. uh, p on petunias, on fuchsias, on quite a few different things. Um, you just have to keep a watch on your baskets. If they're starting to decline, uh, you need to uh, look at them up more closely. I have a little hand lens I take in if I think something's a problem. Aphids you can see with the naked eye. But uh, there are a number of things, spider mites, for instance, that you can't. And uh, I won't give any chemical recommendations on that or biological either, but you can go to your local garden center or call the extension service. Or call service. the hotline at the extension service. That's right. Service. And, uh, and, and they could lead you in the right direction with that. Um, uh, Fungus-wise, the biggest problem most people will have is the root rot funguses that would attack the basket because you're watering too much. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if you water too much, you get a saturation situation uh, the roots eventually start to just rot on their own and it invites in funguses that can, will kill the plant. Um, powdery mildew can be an issue sometimes. Um, that's sort of weather related. And in that case, um, just keeping really good air circulation 
it helps a whole lot. But also most of the fungicides that we might use are a lot better as preventatives than they are curatives. So if you've got something going on, for instance, maybe powdery mildew on your roses, it might not be a bad idea to check your hanging baskets and see if they have it also. And if you were going to make a, uh, an application of something to the roses, you do your baskets as well. And again, there are chemical alternatives and organic alternatives. That's about the, that's the big ones. Mm -hmm. I'd say so. Okay, good. All right, so you're ready to put a basket yeah. together? I, yeah, I was going to uh, put a basket together, going to kind of talk about a few plants. The, the, one the, the most important thing about when you decide to do a basket is you have to decide where you're going to put it so you know what the environment is like. If you have a shade basket, you want to use shade product, no, uh, like fuchsias. Fuchsias are a big one for shade. We got some up in here. We got asparagus fern, which can go from shade to sun. So house plants are really pretty good, like the spider plants. Greg, if you want to lift up that spider plant over there. This is one we've discovered is very durable. Can it even go into full sun? It's just amazing how durable that is. Likewise with that asparagus fern. But copa is kind of an in-between uh, plant. It's like can take uh, probably three-quarter sun to about a quarter sun. And full sun typically means at least six hours of day of sunshine. Uh, the kind of semi-sun, four to six hours, and then you got the shade, which would be less than four hours. So you're going to have to determine how much light your area gets. The um, vinca, some of the ground cover is also good to use. This is one that's kind of just coming out of some dormancy. It's a vinca minor, and that is good for shade. One thing about ground covers, if you put them in a container or a basket, make sure they stay within the container because otherwise you will be ruining the day you let it escape. Several ways to compose the basket. Once you find the location, you decide on your container. That's the other thing, what kind of container that you're going to use. Then you have to determine how many plants you use in a container. A 10-inch basket typically would be three to five plants. A 12-inch would be anywhere from five to seven plants. It would be depending upon the aggressiveness of the plants. Petunias, we would use fewer, fewer plants because they do grow quite well. Uh, things like impatience, you might use a little bit more just because they're more bushy and they're uh, slower growers. The larger city baskets, like what Greg was showing, mm -hmm. you, you plant those up every year. You use right. how many plants? Usually it's only eight or nine plants. Yeah, but they're more petunias and more of the aggressive right. varieties. The interesting thing is that when people come to our workshops, they think they're getting their money's worth by putting more plants in a basket. And uh, that big basket takes eight or nine plants. People will try to fit eight or nine plants in one of these little guys. And so, I'm guilty. Uh, yeah. And uh, nothing wrong with that, but certainly it's going to take more water the more plants you put into it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we have a good time with that. Yeah. And the other thing is uh, there are different ways when you decide, you know, the location, the container that you'd like. If you want to have like a, a all one color, you want all one texture with multiple colors, would you like to have the um, uh, same texture? I, it, it, just so many different choices to make. You have to decide what the color that you like, what kind of scheme you like, what makes you feel good. I'm going to demonstrate using, actually it's uh, kind of a semi-upright geranium. It's uh, really neat. It's got an orange flower, but it's got an inter interesting foliage to it. It's a variegated foliage. It's upright, but it's not strongly upright. Baskets, a lot of times, I don't like using a lot of strong vertical accents because they're pretty high up. You've got a wire coming up, so it impedes. And if you have a low hanging, to, uh, you don't want to grow it up into the ceiling. Planters are different. The, old, the saying out is that the thrillers, fillers, and spillers. Baskets, you want to concentrate more on the fillers and the spillers with maybe a little bit on the vertical. So I'm going to do a, a sun basket here. I'm going to use a, a, the geranium. And you start by now, do you loosely. Have soil? Do you have soil oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. I keep the soil probably, you can see, go ahead and get it so it's about four inches from the top. Probably like a hand, handful right there in a hand depth. So that way when I put the plant in, I can just set it right in there. And that way it's not quite at the top. When you reach across, you should just, the top of the soil should be below your hands, you know, the plant that you're putting in there. 
but I'm going to do this orange geranium. I'm going to do an ivy draining them also, which is kind of a, a burgundy tone. What you can do, if you're using, this is an older plant. We don't have any of the newer plants right now, so I'm using an older plant. So what's going to happen is that you're going to have to, the roots are going to be pretty well established. You're just going to just lightly break them apart. You don't have to massacre the root system. Some people will massacre. In this case, I just set it right in there. And I am doing it such that I have the center, and then I'm going to have six plants around the side just opposite of each other. So two geraniums, two petunias, and then two bacopa. So that way there's balance. You can go three. So you can go like three geraniums and then three bacopa or whatever you like, or you can go all the same, like all petunias. It's really up to you how you like doing it. This is the time also when you can look at your soil depth again. We, we monitor the, the classes when people are um, making their baskets. And almost always, <clears throat> we, we see people pushing down when they've got all their plants in there. Uh, they do that a lot more. They have more soil in than they need, as opposed to having too little. And the problem with having too little would be that you, if you add soil to bring it up a little bit, now you're burying the stems, and mm. that's a bad thing too. That is. So, but Tamara's an expert at putting soil in the pots. I just wanted to show people what a root-bound plant is. That is a root-bound plant. I don't know if you can see how it's just a solid mass, the spider plant. So the real succulent roots. So you can use something like this, but you definitely need to divide it. Now, rough it up. Now I'm going to show you one that's not. This is a, a red petunia. It's one of the uh, newer varieties. It's a trailing petunia. But this one, definitely, it was only planted a couple weeks ago. So there's one root coming out the base there. I don't know if you can even see it. But that is something you have to be careful when you use it. You can use it for baskets, which I'm going to do. And you just have to kind of gently slide it in there because it will just the soil collapses around you. The... Um, Where's the other petunia? There we go. Another petunia. So I'm going to place this opposite. Because I put the first one right over the petunia there. I put it on the other side here. And just kind of set it in there. Like I say, you've got to be careful. I don't want to jam it because I don't want to ruin the, uh, destroy the roots that are establishing itself. Then I'm going to use, those were like the three and a half inch or four inch pots. I'm going to also use some Tray packs, which you can, you know, especially if you're doing multiple plants, it's an affordable way to get more, more baskets. Once again, it's not very well rooted out, but it's rooted out well enough. In this case, since it's so small, I'm going to add a little extra soil to the basket. So that way I'm just not going to hang out in all that depth. So then I'll just stick it in there. I'll put a little soil around it to hold it in place. And then I'll turn it 100 degree, 180 degrees to the other side, put a little soil in there, get the next one out. I'll try to get it from the bottom if I can, but I say they're not very well rooted. And I'll just set it in there and put some soil around that. Now since it's basically put together, and so it's got plants all the way around, now you just have to fill up those holes that you have around because you just set the plants in. You should have gaps in there. You just backfill it with the soil. Lightly press down to make sure you get rid of the air pockets. Air pockets are not roots, a roots friend, so make sure that it's, no, <clears throat> those are taken care of. And so then that's what it looks like. And your soil depth should not be above the edge of the pot because you do want to water well. If it is, you can have a problem with your water because the water will just slide right off. And then the tags, would you do try to save the tags? So that way, at the end of the gardening season, you, know, you just save your tags, stick them in the pot. And the end of the garden season, when you're cleaning up, you'll look and you'll say, oh, that's what I liked. That's what really did well. Or conversely, you can say, oh boy, that plant didn't grow at all. So I don't want to use that again. And so that way you've got your reference point. Or if somebody asks you what's in the container, you can say, this is what's in it. I can pull the tags out and you can read it to them and be a genius. And when you come to our nursery, 
Uh, one of the nicest things about it is that we have a lot of individual plants. It's not like you have to buy a whole six pack of something. We try to have things in smaller uh, containers that if you were going to make a basket, um, we can lead you on to do that. Uh, being at the nursery ourselves, we just walk out there and grab plants and yeah, make baskets. Yeah, that's a nice thing. But, uh, One thing I didn't cover, though, where you're talking about that, is that sometimes you'll get plants, they're talking about being root bound, you get other plants that are, let's say, more well established or they're stretching out. Um, I don't have my clippers with me. There you go. Oh, clippers, there we go. So what you do, so you promote branching, you just give it a, a trim, just cut it back so it's in shape. So that way, you know, you got a nice shape going and it will promote the branching so you'll fill out more. If you like something really long and dangly, go right ahead. It's completely up to you. It's your basket, you do what you like. It's, it's a hard one. We have people that we have to help them trim their plants when they plant because they just think they're hurting it or, or don't I want as much foliage as I can get. Well, if it's going to be in our greenhouses for a month or a month and a half, it's going to uh, flush it's gonna grow. more. It's going to grow. And by m removing that tip, we're, we're allowing those branches, those side branches to grow and give us a nice bushy plant as, as opposed to a long stringy one that might flower earlier, but uh, won't provide the satisfaction we want when it's uh, down the road. Then to finishing touch on the basket, then what you need to do is you, get the, you have to put the wire on. What I do, I just take it down, I take all the wires, I bend them at the same time. So that way I know I have an even connection. Just make a nice U shape. Then I have to divide the wires out, you know, spread them out. And then basically you just find the hole, you go from the underneath, go up, pull it out and back around and you tuck it in inside the basket. So that way you don't have that wire sticking out. Once again, you go from the underneath, you gotta find the, find the hole. That's the hardest part sometimes, finding the hole. But guys do it better. Anyway, up, around, out, and down. Did you say guys do it better? Finding holes, that is. Anyway. Well, I haven't had a problem. You know, Greg hasn't had a problem. Anyway, again, this is kind of a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we get guys to come to our workshops, but uh, I would say it's uh, probably... 95% women. Yeah. And then the last one. Last one's always the hardest because what happens, the wire is pointing out, the way because you bend them all at the same time. Anyway, so all you do, just force it in. You're master of the wire. Up, out, around, back, and in. And then, by this time you should be finished, you got a basket, and that's what it should look like, all finished. And then all you have to do is water it in, and you're set to go. Very good. Uh, yeah, so that's a nice one. And again, if we were keep them, keeping them in our greenhouses, um, we immediately keep them warm. They don't go out uh, and sit in the cold for a couple days. Um, our workshops are done in March, and if you were to make a hanging basket in March, which there's plenty of plants out there on the market, um, and take it home and hang it up, it's going to be a problem. It's cold out, the plants mm -hmm. aren't going to grow. We put them in our greenhouses, they get fed, they're warm. We keep our greenhouses around 59 degrees at night. During the day they might get up... Uh, 65, 70. Yeah, and so that's what they need. Um, so very good. Well, let's, um, let's go to a couple pictures here too. Uh, and then we can discuss what uh, after plant care and things. So, um, okay, this is one of our favorite flowers here. This is a petunia. And this one's called raspberry blast. Uh, there was a time that we would make, what sold well for us was straight petunia baskets. And uh, this petunia has probably been out for 10 years maybe, but it's a vegetatively propagated petunia. These, these are not done from seed. Somebody has developed that through crossbreeding and we've got incredible colors and vigor that comes with those. A lot of those um, newer plants like the um, petunia that Tamara put in here, they're very trailing in nature. A lot of our um, uh, petunias that we had previously were a mounding or a landscape petunia that would grow up, but they wouldn't hang over. 
the only time they would hang over would be if they got so tall that they just fall over. Fall over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they kind of split. Even some of the newer ones will do that too. But then it's like the what you saw with the, with the bug ate, no, that cutworm ate. Um, yes, it starts out big, and all of a sudden it just kind of flows out and over and around. It just, it's just uh, amazing. But sometimes they do split, but then they grow up. You know, mm -hmm. fill in that split. You know, these new varieties. Right. Mm -hmm. And the reason sometimes these plants cost so much, uh, and they are more expensive to buy the premium plants. A, a little marigold or a, a seed type of uh, petunia might cost you $1.49, whereas uh, when it's a bigger one, a super tunia or a wave petunia, they're more likely to be $3.50 a piece or up or to $4. $4. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but somebody has really spent the time on the genetic, uh, they're not genetically modified, but the breeding work that they've done, and usually they're patented. Mm -hmm. And so when we order those little plugs, we have to pay it. Uh, royalty free. We can't even take cuttings from those and grow new plants. Oh. There's patent police that come around <laughs> and check to make sure we yeah. haven't done it. Yeah. Yeah. So next picture. Okay. Uh, this is an awfully nice looking bacopa basket. Tamara put bacopa in her basket and that's the, the white, white flower there. This picture was actually taken in September, middle of September. It's got, I think it's strictly bacopa. There's a white, mm -hmm. I think a pink, and then a blue or mm -hmm. a purpley one. But it looks really, really good. Uh, the, one of the problems with bacopa is that if we miss a watering or two, the flowers will dry up. The plant itself isn't hurt, but then it's got to flush again until it can turn that nice white color. Because you'll lose all the flowers if you miss a watering. Right. So go on to the next one. And what we have then would be pictures of some completed baskets. This is a newer type of begonia. It's either called Bonfire or Santa Cruz Sunset. Most of our begonias like shade, and they don't take much water, uh, which is a good thing if you have shade and you are bad at watering. But this is a sun-loving begonia. And uh, that's only a 10 or a 12-inch basket. And this also was, I think, taken on the same day as that bacopa basket. So uh, that's a pretty good sized basket, but that's, you can make that into a combination also uh, with maybe Bacopa coming out the bottom or a million bells, but it will do well in the sun as well as the shade. So going on to the next one, uh, I think what we have on the, the ones are people who uh, have made baskets and these are some of those baskets. Yeah, I believe this is a basket that our, one of our neighbors made mm -hmm. and she has total shade. It's a, it's a north-facing site with heavy trees and an awning. And so if you looked at that at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it is just dark. Yeah. So what she's used here, and this is also to show that you can get color in a, um, in a shade basket, impatience. Mm -hmm. And notice how full the basket is on top. It looks really, really good. Um, we've got Creeping Jenny. That's the, uh, the yellowy chartreuse flower coming out the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then also lamium or silver nettle? No, lamium. Okay. Well, isn't lamium silver nettle? No, nope, that's lamiastrum silver nettle. Okay. You're so <laughs> smart on that. <laughs> I know a few things. There's, there's also a blue flower in there. Is that? Oh, no, that's the... That's the bloom on the... The, the lamium. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, so she did a great job. And these baskets look pretty good. So also, that is to say that know where that basket's going to go. Tamara talked yeah. about that. If she had a petunia basket that looks so good in May and June and put it underneath there or on the north side of the house, within about a month, those flowers have thinned very, very much, and in two months, there's no flowers. Yeah. So uh, next slide. This is a basket, uh, oh, this is actually that. two baskets together. No, I mean, this is one basket, but the gal made two baskets. And when people come to our workshops, they get to decide then, am I making a small one or a big one? And am I making one or am I making 10? People will, we've had people make a dozen baskets. But this is a basket, and I believe it's in a pulp, that she intends to put in the shade. So what you have, geranium, which doesn't it's love a lot of shade. Oh, red geranium. Yeah, red geranium on the back. It, it will do, we would tell her that this basket needs a half a day of sun. Mm -hmm. It needs morning sun, and then it could take some afternoon shade. But you've got a, a begonia. Uh, Tam, is that an illumination or is that a... It's an illumination. Okay. Is, is that the apricot colored flower? Yeah. And that will actually trail two or three feet. 
So this is a young basket. Mm -hmm. This basket has only been made about... About a month ago. A month ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've got the Bacopa in there. You've got the Creeping Charlie, or Creeping Jenny. Again, there's Creeping Charlie also. But uh, I love that Creeping Jenny just because of the color, so I'm always leading people that way. But uh, she loved her baskets when she picked them up. People can't believe what they look like. <laughs> so uh, we, we could have sold that for good money. Next one. This young lady picked her basket up, and it's, it's not that dissimilar. She's got Bacopa coming out the bottom. It's got a begonia also. Can you see anything else in there? Uh, but a nice, nice full basket. So uh, she, I have to think she made two baskets too. It, often people want to buy things in twos because if they put them on their porch, sure. they want a matching pair. Yeah. Uh, so next one. And I think the last picture is then. This uh, is one of our neighbors here. She made an uh, herb basket. Herb ornamental. Yeah. Because that's apple mint there that's growing up very tall. And there was a spike and then some other, I don't know, euphorbia or something like that in there. Mm -hmm. But she really had fun with that. And this is a hanging basket or, or well, simply a container? Well, you could use it. I, I don't know if she's going to hang it or put it inside a planter that she already had. But you could do it either way. I, I would say that maybe 10% of our people, maybe less, make just planters and not hangers because not everybody has a place to hang their, sure. their plants. Yeah. And all the rules that she talked about, the spillers, thrillers, and fillers, apply even For more planters. so when you're making planters. Yeah. And she's got a lot of stuff there to eat on when she gets home. <laughs> yeah, uh, she, can... she does. <laughs> Yeah, or but, make her mojito. Yeah, or, <laughs> but there's a spike in the middle, the dracaena, that's really a really nice use of textures. We get a lot of our ideas from baskets that people make because they, they do things that we wouldn't so. normally see. Because the only wrong combination of a basket is if you put a sun lover with a shade lover. That's really about the only wrong thing because they're right. not compatible. So and that's, that's your job. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So next one, and we'll go through these rather quickly. This is our good friend Maggie, and Maggie has a petunia basket there. Uh, with it's a yellow petunia uh, and just looking really good. That was a couple years ago. We t we've got a little more gray in us and uh, Maggie was feeling better that day too. Maggie so, helps us with this show. She does. She's one of That's our producers. Right. Yeah. Maggie's a good friend of ours. And one more picture I believe. And this is me standing underneath one of our favorite baskets that we've ever made. Uh, these are our city baskets in Walterville. If we were to measure it, I'm six foot two I'm the same size as those baskets. Yeah, that's impressive. Yeah, so uh, those pictures, that was probably taken in the middle of September. And those baskets are as full on top as they are on the bottom again. That's Biddens on top, or Bidens. It's a little daisy flowered, yellow flower. Mm -hmm. Petunias hanging out the bottom, so it's a really nice mixed basket. Gorgeous, so, gorgeous. Yes. Hey, you guys, thanks so much for doing this and, and for such a, a fun demonstration. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. This has been Gardening and Beyond, a show that amps the term flower power to a whole new level. Join us next week as we brave the benign outdoors. See you then.